Okay. Uh, so thanks for having me. I normally live in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where I teach painting at MICA um, on sabbatical this year and staying at a residency in Rotterdam, which is what brings me to Sweden this week uh, for this conference and for meeting with students. Um, I'm going to be reading off a script a little bit because I don't normally delve so deep into specific projects, so uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, so at the core of my work are critical explorations of labor and class in visual culture. I draw heavily upon the historical decorative arts to find contradictions within the context they originated. In my work, objects such as wallpaper patterns, ceramics, and paintings do not simply reflect the mood of a given culture, but are also tools for critique. Previous works, such as the Domestic Disturbances series, pictured French toile as the vehicle for social and political commentary while visualizing the military-industrial complex post 9-11. So for me, decorative, the decorative is an expression of the social and political. I'm interested in the intersection of contemporary global reality with an often idealized American past, the myth-making of American identity. The Lost Colony Project relates to the Elizabethan age of exploration and the colonization of the New World. Uh, this painting is a um, Large uh, mural uh, detail of the lace collar from Queen Elizabeth I, or Mata, Armada portrait from the 1580s. And the lace includes figures from drawings of John White made in the 1580s of Algonquin Indians along the coast of North Carolina, which is where I'm from. So part of this project, the Lost Colony Project, is about uh, juxtaposing or mashing up disparate um, uh, visual culture. So here you have a portrait of Queen Elizabeth and uh, the less often seen watercolors by John White, which are held in the British Museum. So I think of Elizabethan culture um, and El Queen Elizabeth as a feminine icon of colonialism. Um, and the title for this piece comes from an apocryphal or uh, after her death uh, quote from Queen Elizabeth. So its um, authenticity is in dispute. Uh, this piece was installed at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis in 2012. It's also part of the Lost Colony Project. Uh, it's digitally printed wallpaper from hand-painted originals, uh, painted hollowed-out gourds, um, pearls, and uh, gouache painting on paper. I'm showing this piece because one of the things I think is interesting about the artist working in an archive, in this case uh, Elizabethan colonialism, and my sort of search for understanding of American identity and how the sort of American uh, myth was born through the colonization of North America by the British. Um, one of the things that I have done here um, in this wallpaper pattern is copy a uh, painting of Queen Elizabeth, the Hardwick Hall portrait um, by the workshop of Nicholas Hilliard. Uh, this is a portrait that was made in 1599, and here you can see the portrait in situ. Um, I was fascinated by this kind of fantas fantastical dress and the um, you know, fantastical creatures uh, displayed in the dress. And I noticed as I was copying that um, not only does this sort of act um, represent my way of engaging with uh, the decorative arts and history and how the decorative arts explain political ideology of an era, in this case, Queen Elizabeth's clothing had embroidered on it um, details of creatures found in the sea, right? So it's sort of a, um, a mirroring of this um, sea faring uh, that was do being done at the time um, by the pri privateers and the pirates, I would even call them, uh, from this era. And so um, what I found most interesting with this kind of act of copying I was doing that I found something that I haven't been able to s find if anybody else has noticed, but a horseshoe crab uh, in the detail of the dress, which you can kind of see. Can you see it? Yeah, sort of in the middle at the bottom above the right foot. And the horseshoe crab is not native to the waters around England. It's native to uh, the Atlantic uh, coast of North America as well as other parts um, of uh, Asian waters. So this would be a kind of creature found only because of the colonial exploration. So I find it really interesting that through this copying that I was doing, I was able to discover a detail that perhaps 
someone else has discovered but maybe hasn't published and put out there. But um, this kind of copying or appropriation is really important part of my practice. It's a way that I understand how images are constructed and that kind of close looking that comes with copying is a real part of my um, artistic process. And then finally, a little bit more introduction about another project called the American Catastrophe Report. It's an installation that acts as both homage and critique of the decorative frescoes in the United States Capitol building, originally painted in the 19th century by Italian-born artist Constantino Bermidi. My site-specific artwork was installed in American University's Katzen Art Center in both the upper and lower rotunda and the center of the building, less than six miles from where Bermidi's paintings are located. The prints forming American Catastrophe Report have the appearance of paintings due, the, due to the unique process I use where I hand paint the originals, then digitally scan them in for printing for long-term public display. So I updated Brumidi's capital ornamentation by directly addressing ecological disasters in America that have been caused by human activities hence the title American Catastrophe Report. And there was a kind of sign off to the side that you can see that detailed um, the name of the, the project as well as the specific sites that I was referencing in each um, kind of cartouche or each the center of each design. Um, and so here you can kind of see it's sort of an experiential painting. Um, you really have to walk around the space to see it. And it, since you guys don't know the Brumidi corridors, this is what they look like. Um, Brumidi's original frescoes in the U.S. Senate wing that picture landscapes of the sparsely populated western states of the mid-19th century, as well as a variety of detailed images of birds. Brumidi was instructed to carry out an elaborate, elaborate decorative scheme based on Raphael's loggia in the Vatican. Okay. Uh, Brumidi copied from lithographs in the Pacific Railroad Report and the Mexican Boundary Report, published in the 1850s. It is possible that Brumidi's incorporation of these landscapes were intended to not only celebrate scenic visions of America, but also to promote a comprehensive identity of American geography and inevitable Western settlement. Further promoting specificity of place, the birds pictured in the Senate wing point to the importance of uniquely American subject matter in Brumidi's efforts. And here in this case, you can even see Brumidi had left empty um, cartouches that since then have been added with more contemporary events, such as the landing on the moon, uh, right? So um, this is something that he had kind of planned into this. And so you can see it's a variety of um, frescoes throughout this building. And you can go tour it. I highly encourage you next time you go to Washington, D.C., uh, you just, uh, twice a day, I think, they have a tour. It takes about an hour, and it's a really special place to visit. So um, extending and celebrating this act of copying, I updated Brumidi's masterful efforts with similar themes landscapes and ornithological images, birds, but with a decidedly different artistic outcome. Reflecting a century and a half of human enterprise since Brumini's time, a selection of landscapes and decorative cartouches offer up these situations. Fracking in rural Pennsylvania, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, mountaintop removal mining in West Virginia, uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and climate change, which I specified as glacial retreat in Alaska. Uh, con corresponding to each man-made ecological disaster and pointing towards the totalizing effects of habitat destruction, pollution via chemicals and garbage, and changes in weather conditions, I included several, several birds that represent the threats to fauna as environmental destruction advances. Um, these, these birds would be specific to each place, so in this case of glacial retreat in Alaska, it would be the tufted puffin. So, I want to talk about this project I did. Uh, I have sort of three main projects I'm going to show you now, sort of exemplifying the ways I've worked with archives and collections. Uh, this was an invitation from a group of curators um, at a project called Unraveling the National Trust at the Nyman's House and Gardens in Sussex, UK, which is just south of London. 
Ah, this is my grand tour fan. Am I going, am I speaking too quickly? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, this um, Nyman's House and Gardens is a National Trust property known primarily for its exquisite English garden, which has been designed and developed by three generations of the Messel family, the Messel family, beginning in the 19th century. My artworks are large-scale fans inspired by the Messel family antique handheld fan collection at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, UK, which is fantastic that you're here because uh, what, a, what a funny thing, this is a project where I didn't ask for permission to use this collection, right? So I was... <laughs> So I was really thrilled to find out when we were on the same seminar here. <laughs> so I took this, yeah, yeah, sorry, Miranda, sorry, Fitzwilliam Museum. This is what happens when museums make their collections readily available online too, right? Which was great for me since I was working from the United States about British subjects. So um, the exhibition was spearheaded by three artists who acted as curators uh, working directly with the Nyman's House and the National Trust. I was one of eight artists, I think, um, eight artists, which uh, w with works that were situ situated around the house and the gardens. Um, so the fan forms that I made for this project um, from the collection, uh, these, fa sorry, uh, I, the, the fan forms from the collection at the Fitzwilliam Museum serve as templates for new iterations that merge ornament with contemporary landscape scenes from around Sussex, where the Messels built their Nyman's home. Following the example of fans, which appear to be windows into other worlds, so this is one of them I was looking at, uh, windows into other worlds, I bring other worlds into the Nyman's gardens with the eye of the tourist looking for the not so picturesque. Grand Tour Fan appropriates the original 18th century Grand Tour Fan on display at the Fitzwilliam Museum. This fan inserts intentionally banal public places from contemporary Sussex life into the historical framework, substituting scenes of Italian ruins with those of Gatwick Airport, which is just a few miles from the Nyman's house where the work was installed. And I was also thinking about this as an artist who didn't have the luxury to fly back and forth between um, America and England and sort of this idea of the tourist I would be when I went to actually situate my work to install it, how um, I kind of had to make this work without really being in the place. And I was, I guess I was sort of also thinking about the non-site, sort of this Robert Smithson-esque idea of a non-site or this kind of place that really isn't monument mo monumentalized by um, an organization like the National Trust. So what is an anti-monumental site in the area? Sort of the opposite of a beautiful garden. Um, so these are made of expanded PVC material. So that's like a plastic that has been milled by a CNC printer. That means computer numerically controlled. So I would design, here's the second fan. And so, yeah, I would design a digital file that I would draw the design I wanted and then I would have the machine cut it out. And it was kind of modular, so I was able to actually um, unfold the fan and kind of screw it together with these binding posts. And then I could uh, fold it back up and ship it um, easily for the cross-country trip. Um, and the fans are hand-painted. They're kind of like these out-of-scale theatrical props. Uh, their placement in the setting provides a rich contrast to the mission of the National Trust to protect and preserve the historic heritage of England. So you've seen the one with the representations of Gatwick Airport, uh, which was historically a manor and dairy farm before it was an airport. Or uh, in this case, this Rococo fan here with these beautiful maidens and bugle boys and flowers. Um, has been turned into uh, scenes from the M23 roadway between London and Nyman's house, um, which is sort of like uh, elevating these absurdist non-sites into these uh, monumentalized places. So this was how I imagined my trip might go, coming from Gatwick Airport to the historic home, looking at these sort of hideous um, constructions. So the completely banal in contrast with the mission of the natural National Trust. So my name is Jason Bowman and I work here. Um, <coughs> Found Academy 
I did the reverse thing to Miranda. So I sat at dinner last night, and then somebody asked me a very specific question, which was, are you going to talk about any of your artworks? And I hadn't intended to. And then I went home um, last night and decided, actually, maybe I should talk about some works. Um, so I changed the nature of the presentation. Um, the works that I don't think I've really spoke about here before. But what they are doing really is residing the interface between um, the making of an artwork, so as an artist, but also presentations of works that I've undertaken as a curator. Um, because I do both those things and the, the merging of those two things isn't quite as simply sort of separated as one, including myself at times, may hope for them to be. Um, and I think that what is happening is that within this kind of sort of question, this type of seminar, that the, that um, whilst um, we have particular sort of uh, languages in the rhetoric of the way that the um, seminar is being discussed, the question of anatomizing, intervention, interpretation, um, incisions, um, etc., I think that we are also um, potentially in a dynamic of wrapping, knotting, unknotting, or tying. And uh, this obviously is a Duchamp's 16 miles of string from uh, 1940. Two and it's it's I'm not going to talk about um, Duchamp in this kind of sort of um, sense in relation to this sort of piece of work. It's basically just there as an illustration of um, nodding or tying or untying. And what I'm going to try to do here, in a sense, is to tie myself in knots as I go through the presentation, as opposed to attempt to be um, entirely sort of coherent or or to provide um, substrata within it. Okay. There are a few assumptions, I suppose, that um, I want is to be able to maybe consider, and this relates, I think, to some of the points that Miranda has made. Um, this is a sculptural work um, from this year, not by me. Um, in, in in April of this year, I don't know if people are aware of this, but this was a sculpture that was placed into Fort Green Park in Brooklyn um, in April of this year. It arrived early morning. It was an unsolicited work. It was unveiled as this, and it was gone by 2 p.m. Um, and it is a portrait of Edward Snowden. Um, it took over a year in production itself. Um, it is a very formal piece of work. Um, it took the practitioners over a year to make in the uh, studio. It was placed into Fort Greene as an intervention into a very specific dynamic within the public park, uninvited um, by the institution um, and its forms of governance who hold the park. And it was removed um, within a matter of hours and hasn't publicly resurfaced. Um, and the reason that I wanted to sort of show this isn't just because of the question of sort of Snowden, but the question of whistleblowing um, sort of overall um, within the dynamics of artists working in intervention mechanisms within the museum. And in what sense of whistleblowing are we to consider this? Um, because whistleblowers ordinarily are there, you know, sort of um, to not necessarily produce critique, but to remind us of some other mode of consciousness that we are seeking to avoid. And that can be both within the legal frame, within an ethical frame, within the question of moralities, etc. And I think that this, in a sense, connects to sort of um, a question around different sort of uh, research mechanisms at play within different frameworks. So the museological has um, a different potential understanding of telos, um, so you know, sort of of common good or purpose and um, or purposefulness. Um, in that the museum, historically at least, has two sort of primary roles, an educational role and an aesthetic role, and the interface of those sort of two things within museological sort of histories. Within medicine and medical science, and, you know, sort of which is one of our kind of concerns here, you know, sort of, um, we do have a set of ethical frameworks around those kind of sort of um, 
questions and particularly within sort of research methodologies in relation to sort of medicine that also address this kind of question of telos. Um, the notion of polis versus telos or the interface of the two things within contemporary art seems to be doing a different thing. Um, and the contemporary art seeks, obviously, you know, sort of to have an extremely critical sort of potentiality around itself, but it hasn't developed um, a firmer a sense of its own ethical framework around how that sort of happens. And I think that this informs, in a sense, this selection of the artist as potential whistleblower. Um, but the whistleblowing seems to occur, as Miranda really clearly identified, within a set of different kinds of, sort of strata, and strata over a time period um, as well, you know, sort of as she identified almost a 40-year history of, you know, sort of artist interventions in the way that we are kind of considering them, but ones that, that um, begin, in a sense, with a Baudrillardian notion of the, un the, un the, the host, the problematic sort of hosting situation, into a sort of strata now of deep personal subjectivity and the reorganization of collections you identified with um, Grayson Perry. But um, I, I have this here basically as a consideration, OK, what do we mean by this contemporary whistleblower now, particularly in a moment of fundamental social de-imagining and social control, where we anticipate they're no longer to um, desire sort of um, fundamental critical subjects to be playing this role of whistleblowing and for them to be interred in particular political circumstances. So we intern, you know, sort of um, Snowden, but we expect that artists are still able to have this fundamental critical role. And there is something kind of going on in this question of, OK, so who or what is the artist societally when Snowden is to be a criminal? You know, sort of, and, and what levels of play um, are we considering this uh, within sort of ethics, but also in relation to the question of what is the function of the museum and what is the function of the artist within the museological sort of frame? Um, and this is, you know, sort of um, information. It's an image um, again by Hans Hacker, um, and it's. Uh, it's a work that was placed into an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1970. But this this exhibition um, information, you know, sort of um, claims or claimed at that time to be the first conceptual art exhibition mounted by an American museum. And I think it's important here that I provide some sort of caveat that within um, American rhetoric, um, the museum can be a contemporary art museum, whereas within a European context, we tend to think of museums as being historic as opposed to contemporary in this slight sort of um, different sort of a uh, recognition within it. But what I think is also interesting in terms of hacker um, is that we seem to also be operating most often around um, a sort of post-conceptualist frame within contemporary art. And we also seem to be operating potentially in a post-institutional critique moment. But I also wanted to take this well, to remind us, in a sense, is to return to sort of ben Benjamin Buchlow's consideration that if, if conceptualism is fundamentally an administrative practice, and this is something that the American art historian Julian Brian Wilson has also recently um, argued in her essay on Hans Hacker as administrator, you know, sort of um, through her essay, um, which is titled Hans Hacker's Paperwork, that what Hacker is. Um, historically doing in a sense is producing the artist as administrator within a particular sort of situation. It's something that I maybe want to return to because um, I think it's important that we don't necessarily think only about artists in this situation as people who make artworks to go into the museological frame situation or context or to interpret it, but also to recognize that um, artists within the history of museological frameworks have also been directors of museums or have, have been operated within museological frames in different way, which Matty Pye's um, book, you know, sort of uh, artworks, is is one is absolutely groundbreaking in considering the potentiality of artists operating within administrative frameworks of um, institutions. So I basically want to remind us that the the making of artworks is not the only role that artists can take within this sort of dynamic um, overall. Um, Fred Wilson's um, seminal sort of uh, exhibition that's been alluded to several times here um, so far already, Mining, mining the Museum. Um, and I, I do have a sort of question for us about what does it actually mean when we place one object 
into a sort of visual frame of another set of objects. You know, sort of, and I, I sort of mean this in an ontological sort of sense of what does this actually become? Is it interruptive? Is it divisive? Is it informative? Does it sort of destabilize the uh, master narrative? Is that the whistleblow? You know, sort of, and and what through what methodological frames actually does that sort of occur? Um, I'd like to also, this is um, Zaha Hadid's uh, Maxi, you know, sort of a um, museum um, in Italy. Um, and I, the reason it's there is that I think it can be very easy to consider the museum in a sort of um, trapped sense of time in the way that sometimes Mark Dion has advocated that actually we should just keep them as they are and move on to building a new sort of a museum so that we can look at it with um, a periodic eye. But I think that um, whilst, as, as it was raised earlier on um, from the women from Brighton Pavilion, you know, sort of many museums maintain um, static um, exhibitions, but many museums do not. Um, and museums, you know, sort of um, are not necessarily always trapped in time as well. And their collections move, they shift across museums globally, you know, sort of um, the pattern of, you know, sort of um, events with Within museum structures is huge, you know, sort of, and moving very, very rapidly and quickly. And I think that there is, you know, sort of um, considerations of temporalities that we need to be considering when we think about this framework of the intervention. Is it is it in a temporal frame? How does it sit into this notion of uh, the museum in an understanding that the museum itself is constantly in flux and shift, both organisationally, politically, but actually physically, including its display methodologies and mechanisms. So I suppose that what I'm suggesting in a way is that um, we have this constant wrapping um, and unwrapping of a set of dynamics. And this is Cornelia Parker's uh, work where she takes 16 miles of uh, Duchampian sort of string and wraps it around uh, Rodin's Kiss, um, originally at um, the Devine Galleries at Tate Britain, but more recently transposed into this exhibition, her career retrospective at the Whitworth um, Art Gallery in Manchester. So what we are now have is a work that is transposed from its original sort of physical context of the Devines into an exhibition elsewhere, which involves um, the insurance mechanism operating of the shift of Rodin's case from Tate, quite a complex thing, into the Whitworth. And the Whitworth is not a museum, it is an art gallery, but it is within an academic institution. So there are multiple sort of frames of these um, teleological dynamics that are sort of um, taking place there. Um, I suppose I should apologise that we're still no nearer the medical museum, <laughs> but um, we're going to, but I think. Uh, my talk hopefully sort of follows quite neatly from Jason. So, um, Jason mentioned the book that I published in 2013, so I'm going to sort of start a little bit there. But we've got, um, we're, we're going to, I suppose I'm sitting here as artist, as administrator, and here's an exam example from 1954 that on the left side, this is the circulation department, which was a post-war department of the V&A. And their role within the structure of the, well, actually they predate post-war, but um, this is obviously what that department looked like at that time. But their role was largely about taking parts of the collection and distributing it around the country. And it, and it would go to art schools, local and regional museums. And um, so it played a very p important role in dissemination of knowledge and ideas. And the person who was the keeper of this department in the post-war period was a man called Peter Flood, who let's just say, had very left-leaning sympathies. Some described him as a communist. He wasn't actually sort of a signed-up member. But he certainly made appointments very consistently with people with this very kind of left-leaning sympathies. And that was not remotely unusual at the time. It was very sort of common that artists uh, and those interested in the arts would have that sort of leaning, you know, at the time of the Attlee government, 
you know, there was very much a push to a move towards a different society and the establishment of the National Health Service, etc. That you know it was an obvious mode. But there were because at that time the VNA was a civil service department, there were people who were moved out of areas that were deemed sensitive, be they um, connected with defence, with education, with the Home Office, and it was seen that a museum was a safe place for these people with these left-leaning, you know, what, what, what damage could they do in a museum? So I think that's a kind of interesting s uh, space to start. But there were also, when we researched, quite a number of people, mainly women who had been at art school, been at the Slade School of Art, been at Reading School of Art, and were kind of coming to find a job. And I wanted to, with my colleague, Dr. Linda Sandino, we wanted to investigate what were the skills that artists were going to bring into the museum, and what was the perception from within, within the institution of what these people were giving the museum. So essentially, it is a lot to do with their flexibility, their ability to communicate, and their their ability to kind of move across the hierarchy. That most of these people were happy to do whatever that you gave them. They were very good, neat administrators. It was it was marked that they were very good at kind of ordering that side of collections. But they also were happy to kind of talk to the delivery men on the back road, and if needs be you know, paint the plinths, that they would, where they would take these multiple roles. So this is kind of where I'm coming from. So this was the book, and these were its two main aims, to examine the history and impact of artists working as mu museum professionals and to explore how subjectivities are managed in cultural labour. So looking a little bit more closely, so taking the histories... Um, so on the far left, you have Joshua Reynolds, the founder of the Royal Academy. In the middle, Godfrey Sykes. And on the right-hand side... Uh, oh, sorry, gone completely blank. Uh, anyway, let's come... Let's, 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 so in terms of... The Royal Academy, we were, we were talking both to Charles Samurai Smith, who's still the artistic director of the Royal Academy, um, and he was looking at the roles that artists have played in the, in, in the nature of curation, and I suppose much more in line with what Miranda was setting up, that these kind of artists at massively at the top of their game, working with the top, top institutions. And he was looking at having just had very, very successful exhibitions at the Royal Academy of David Hockney and Anish Kapoor, that in the case of artists like that, in both, in both scenarios, there was a curator and there was the artist. But he was really asking what role could the curator possibly play. And one of the, one of the kind of reasons that, or one of the things behind that, that Jason and I have sort of talked about over the last couple of days is the fact that artists like Anish Kapoor and David Hockney have a staff that far exceeds anything that the Royal Academy would have. So these artists are actually coming almost as their own institution to the institution. And who's really going to intervene with what they want to do? So what is the role of the curator? But if you look retrospectively, we also were looking at Charles Eastlake, one of the directors of the National Gallery. And when the National Gallery was set up, it was sort of taken as read that the person who should be looking after a collection of paintings would obviously be a painter, um, because they would have the right sensibilities to make sense of that collection, to analyse it. But there came a point in the history of the National Gallery where that that was sharply called into question, and that was called into question for a number of reasons. And one was, again, broadly speaking, this idea of the role that a director of 
a museum should play within a political sphere, the way in which they were going to interact with other institutions, their role internationally, the way in which they would um, disseminate scholarship there. And, and one of the things that was called into question about an artist was whether an artist could possibly be someone who could be objective in those terms. Could an artist not, you know, would an artist only look at what they liked? You know, and I think if we, again, if we think back to, you know, Miranda's talk, and I certainly sort of was at a conference where just after at the British Museum, just, just after Grace and Perry had been there. And um, <coughs> he certainly had kind of ruffled many, really, in exactly that sort of really um, quite dictatorial, this is what I want, I want to do this. And, and the very nature that you kind of described quite lightly of, you know, this, I'm just a man writing to a museum asking if I could come into your stores and move things around and can I have an exhibition, please? And I'm going to, in a moment, kind of investigate a little bit more, like what is actually at play when people are making that kind of intervention at that level that that, that seems perfectly rational and reasonable. So it's kind of two-sided. but. At the time, the National Gallery, that th this was a big debate. How could that happen? So um, we were looking at those kind of power figures at the top, but I also wanted to look at other people within the hierarchy. And obviously, coming from the context of the v &A, which is about art, design, the decorative arts, performance, craft, you know, a much wider range of objects. And from its starting point, design is central. So. Godfrey Sykes, um, it was wonderful seeing Lauren's presentation in Washington. We can imagine Godfrey Sykes sort of running off on the grand tour with Henry Cole, the founding director of the V&A, with a sketch pad in Venice, kind of with Henry Cole saying, like that, like that, okay, okay, sir, right, where are we going next? And they were, he was replicating and building into the construction of the museum this canonical architecture of the best and the most tasteful. Um, but I think that within the museum, there are all this, this lovely little etching of art. It's an, an alphabet. And as you come up the ceramic staircase of the V&A, there are these alphabet-sized tiles that each have obviously a different figure, but he is I, artist. And within the sort of fabric of the building, beside these grand narratives, there are also these lighter, more playful interventions like I, artist, and then within the courtyard uh, where the garden is, there are all these kind of mosaic friezes, and there's one very high up that if you didn't know it was there, you'd never find it, but there are sort of definitions and allusions to work, and Godfrey Sykes came from Sheffield, which is the centre of the steel industry, and there is a picture of steel workers kind of pushing a trolley, and um, and I I was sort of interested in these much more subtle, but lo when when Jason was talking about temporality and time, that I think it's taken <laughs> decades, you know, almost a century for people to actually see these traces embedded in the bu in the building, which I think is very interesting. And then um, the f the the person on the right is Martin Hardy, who was the keeper of what we now call the word and image department. And I became fascinated by him when I talked to a retired curator who showed me his obituary that said, that was in the most patronizing tone, said, Martin Hardy, etcher and bureaucrat. And um, he, he you know, and I just felt like I've got to know more about these people and they, they must have greater significance. So I'm just going to touch lightly on these things. And then, um, you know, we've all talked so far about interventions and there are all sorts of ways and meanings within that. But I'm going to kind of say a little bit about, you know, what, what our sense of interventions were. So on the left side, this is um, an exhibition at the Wellcome Institute, which is... It does have a medical <laughs> bent. I think that's probably the only one in my talk. But by a man called Callum Storey, 
who is a designer. And one of the things that I think is massively underrepresented, and I think, again, we have to think of the scale of production with some artists' interventions, but the role that the designer is playing in the way in which we interpret, experience, the impact of these exhibitions. And Callum Storey ha was a designer at the British Museum, and he was working on the the Egyptian collections and very simply what was happening, which has happened in many, many museums in their re-curatorial sort of manifestations of collections is that because in museums we have to create more space for people, lots of objects are being moved out and they are reconfigured in design terms more like art exhibitions. So where there were kind of forests of Egyptian bits and bobs, you know, you pick out your best ten, you know, there's three years of scholarship that goes into working out what's going to go in that cabinet, but really you're, cr you're, you're creating more space and more flow for a, 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 a hugely increased number, particularly in the big national museums. It's about getting people through. So he was working in the capacity of designer, but he was also in his subjectivity as an artist and designer completely in mourning in some respects for those museums that were these kind of flaneur type sites that you just encountered and so he wrote a book called The Delirious Museum trying to kind of pull back into the world of the Louvre that you that is completely experiential and sensate and I think again that's been brought up and particularly in sort of Jason's examples, where you are giving trust to the viewer or the audience to believe that they can make up their own experience. They can just absorb what's there and take it. You don't have to completely uh, hold it together for them in a, in a concise na narrative. Um, and then in the centre is a textile which was collected by Barbara Morris, who we saw... Uh, oh, she's just, she's just there on the left-hand side. Um, and she collected this in Budapest. And one of the things that was uh, very prevalent to my interest is also about networks and the way in which different artists curators and the circles in which they operate and that what an enormous impact they have on the way in which we c where which they construct their understanding and their practice and I think I can sort of pull out some examples as we go along just sort of within this room but so she she was traveling with her husband sort of behind the iron curtain and she extended her trip to say, you know, essentially writing to her keeper to say, if I stay here, I've got there's loads of connections and I think I can buy some interesting things for the collection and bring them back. So a completely unofficial way of collecting, but those things are sometimes the most interesting. Um, again, the, the person who is my source of knowledge about Martin Hardy tells wonderful stories about running across Checkpoint Char Charlie in Berlin to collect um, posters in this sort of early 80s. And often there are these uh, sort of strategies and structures for collection, but there are also these completely incidental chance ways in which they happen. And then on the right-hand side is Keith Harrison, but I'm going to come on to him. So, so yes, I mean, I've said a little bit already, but I'm interested in the way between the, the sort of the inconsistencies to many, in many respects between the way in which artists present themselves and the way in which art history presents them, the way in which the museum, you know, that, that there are a kind of, there are a series of narratives that I think require more investigation. So this is the um, etcher and bureaucrat um, sitting in his laboratory and the, the Royal College of Art, as we know it now, used to be the school was embedded within the V&A. So essentially his office, just the other side of his office, was where the printmaking department sat. So there was a sliding door. And when he'd finished his administration and bureaucracy at night, he would slide back the door and um, get on with his etching. Um, and one of the things that was 
essential and, and, and pertinent, pertinent to that was that he, he felt he needed to know how things were made and that was how his eye was established to collect and to build his collection was a deep understanding um, and I think you know I think that Laur Lauren was sort of suggesting this the importance of pausing and looking harder and by making that is certainly a way in which that is enhanced so um, I wanted to credit that so obviously, um, in my case, I'm really not talking about audiences. I'm not talking about the people who come to the museums. I'm actually looking at the museum as a world in itself, and the people within the museum are the audience for the work that I'm talking about. But I did think that in both these cases, it's good to note that you know nobody's actually looking at the work. They are... Um, just simply present.